So today on Gear and Review, we're going to do something a little bit different. I've got a couple of my really close friends. It's Matt Maynard and Chuck Sokola. Um, I figured, you know, to get other people's opinions on stuff would actually, you know, uh, I don't know, I guess be a little bit better than uh, the traditional format that I've been doing. Um, we're going to release a couple of videos that are going to be mostly more like roundtable discussions and then we may actually throw in some uh, product reviews or product demos or product opinions or whatnot. Um, but today's topic is going to be um, iconic guitars and I guess what I mean by that is when you're thinking of rock and metal, which we are combining together in this discussion, uh, when you're thinking of rock and metal, what is the instrument that comes to mind for you as being the iconic instrument of that genre? Um, I'm kind of torn for myself. It's 50% Stratocaster, 50% Super Strat. I kind of like, I made this huge list. And um, I listed all the players that I listened to that played uh, Les Pauls. I listed all the players that, you know, I listen to and play Strats, Super Strats, uh, Flying V's, and uh, by and large, the, the biggest list was Super Strat. I mean, I think just about everyone that I have been a, a fan of at some point in their career, everyone from, you know, Steve <laughs> Rogers, Joe Satriani, Ty Tabor, uh, uh, Petrucci, just absolutely everybody that I could come up with at some point or other, Alex Skolnick, at some point in their career played Super Strats. Um, so, Real. I would say, well, without my personal pre preference, which I'll say in a second, is yours, uh, Les Paul or Strats, it's split, it's split pretty evenly, but my favorite would be, like you, the Super Strat, because I came up in that era and that was just the deal where everything yeah. fell together as far as like an instrument with the features that you wanted and it could do everything you needed it to do. But um, I mean, it's split pretty evenly between, you can just name the you know, Les Paul players, Gary Moore, freaking uh, Sykes, freaking Sykes, Sykes. Uh, uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Page, freaking anybody, Strat players, Richie Blackmore, Jimmy, if you want to include that, sort of including rock Ingbe. metal. Ingbe, and that was later, but I mean, I mean, even before that, um, like, you know, Uli Roth. Uli, yeah, Uli. Um, yeah, I mean, and I, not, I, mean, I can't listen with that. There, <laughs> were, there weren't too many damn uh, Flying V guys that I followed except for, uh, you know, Scorpions, Rudolph Shanker, Rudolph Shanker. and and, uh, and freaking Michael Shanker's Michael brother. Shanker, yeah. Um, I love the Flying V guitar, and I kind of I went into it. And then if you wanted to throw in Randy Rhodes, Randy Rhodes, it's fine. But man, I mean, you know, Randy Rhodes is a hard one because uh, when I made up my list of Les Paul people, he's got that Paul iconic man. picture of him with the white uh, Les Paul custom, and it's like that's always been how I've always, even though his signatures were were the, v, the, the real Randy Rhodes full V, v and then the, the, the road shape, right. Um, which I think I don't think he actually got to play that one. I think he died right when that it was, was going to production. Yeah. Which one, the road shape? The road the, shape. the final version. Of the yeah. Road, yeah. The one that he actually played. What? Who made that one? Wasn't it a? Uh, it was Carl. Uh, 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 Carl Sandoval. Sandoval. Yeah, yeah, Sandoval. That's it. Um, that would have been the polka dot yeah. right. colored one. Um, but I think it was commissioned for Jackson because he was mm -hmm. doing this through Grover. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I wanted the V to be kind of like um, the guitar, you know, because I've always liked the V, but then when I thought about how many players that I actually listened to that <laughs> played a V, it was like a pretty short, pretty short list. Then I thought Les Paul. I mean, I can go wrong with Les Paul, but I don't know, you know. I, my, Les Paul and, my Les Paul and Strat list were pretty much split pretty evenly down the middle. It's really interesting when you see the dichotomy of the uh, Les Paul versus the Strat, because just from the beginning, uh, you know, obviously the the Les Paul was the 
big mass-produced electric guitar that started everything. And you know, a lot of people go back to um, to playing that just based on the fact that Les Paul played it. You know, right. um, and Leo Fender kind of democratized the guitar with the um, the process innovations and materials uh, that went into the Strat, which made that more available to somebody who wouldn't necessarily be able to afford a Gibson, uh, like a, yeah. an E335 uh, or a Les Paul or something like that. So, they're, you know, and they kind of went down this divergent trajectory, but they both made like this indelible mark in our culture, mm -hmm. and it, not just in, in rock, but, you know, like we said, they're death metal guys who play strats, and, mm -hmm. you know, they're country guys who play strats, and Play Les Pauls for that matter too. Uh, I yeah, I always think it's funny how people take the Strat and they are determined to put the Strat, like we were talking earlier, Telecasters, try to take those instruments put them in very narrow boxes. And I'm like, um, you know, it's just like I, every time, any time someone tells me you can't play metal on a Strat, I just like to just sit there and rattle, off, start rattling off names. Like, what do you mean? It's like that Strat. There's Strats all through metal music. Yeah. I was like. Um, but the, you know the, the the problem I've always had with the Stratocaster on a personal note is it was designed initially to be, from a production standpoint, to be an easier made, cheaper version, yep. more affordable. So when I see Strats coming out of their custom shop for three thousand, four thousand dollars, I'm like, come on! I mean, we we kind of or or the ink. What the, am I really paying for? <laughs> The Ingve Play Loud Strat for twenty five oh, grand. Jesus Christ! <laughs> the only thing worse than that is, look, I like Uli. I love Uli's music, Uli John Roth. But somewhere along the line, that man has started smoking crack. <laughs> I went on his website and looked at his Sky guitar, and we're talking cars. Yeah, cars. Thirty thousand, twenty five thousand, twenty thousand. I'm like, I will never freaking pay a guitar to cost twenty thousand dollars. And, and not because I couldn't put together the money to buy it, because I, I wouldn't. I mean, I just can't, I can't see having a guitar that costs the same yeah, amount of money as my car. You know how bad I am with not one, one damn scratch on my And if I got some gouge or scratch and something like that, I'd be tripping. Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd murder a family of six if I got lint on that guitar. That's just, I, yeah, but. So I think we were all kind of careful before we went into this not to show our hands as it were yeah. to kind of make this uh, spontaneous but I was doing a little bit of calculation thing I'll bet you somebody says Strat and somebody says Les Paul so I've been sitting here thinking as far as an iconic uh, guitar and let's say this is a catch-all because it's not just one manufacturer who's done it but one that kind of designed it and, and right. put it in the market first but I'm going to say the Flying Bee. Okay. Because um, you know the the Kramer Vanguard, the um, the original Kramer uh, King V, mm -hmm. they were basically the same thing. Um, but I think it's something that when you see that space age fifty shape, to this day, it's just a silhouette. You don't see the strings or the bridge or the you know what it signifies, yeah, you know what right? Is, yeah. yeah. And there's so many. Started off, it was first embraced oddly enough, even though if you think of it like this super metal guitar by uh, blues players. Uh, when it first came out, it was the, the first market that really kind of um, jumped mm -hmm. for it. And they were a hard sell in the 50s because they came out with the, um, the Explorer and, and all these uh, things that uh, were brand new and, and very adventurous uh, designs. But it took them until almost a decade for them to get any real acceptance in the market. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of interesting to see the, uh, the trajectory that those guitars took. I think that's a I think that's a problem with uh, Gibson as a whole. Is I think they tend to have a whenever they come up with something cool or innovative or groundbreaking, their their audiences tend to be very traditional like and as a result it usually takes any new design that they come up with, it usually takes time for it to gain any sort of traction. We could have a completely separate discussion on Gibson and their their marketing strategies <laughs> and, and stuff, but I mean they, they kind of it's a prison they built for themselves yes. in the seventies and eighties because mm -hmm. it became we're a heritage you know yeah. manufacturer. This is all traditional you know, uh, and then 
they expect they can throw something like a like the Robo Tuner out. Yeah. Which would have been cool if they made a couple of models, but they put it on their entire line, and not everybody wants one of those things. They, uh, someone, I mean, I look, I was working at Guitar Center when that came out, and the only thing I can say about that whole era is someone in marketing was asleep at the wheel. Yeah. Because the one thing all companies should know, if you don't know anything else, if you can't predict anything else, you should know your target audience. And your target audience hated that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to hear it every day. Customers coming in complaining about the changes Gibson had made. Because, because instead of doing the smart thing, which would have been taking all these changes that they wanted to do and making one model and introducing that model, they just did the changes to the entire line. And it was just the most, re it was sort of stupid. Uh, um, the only thing I can figure is that by the time they had spent so many millions of dollars in R&D on that thing, they had to recoup it somehow, and they just put it on everything. And, and you know, when we're talking about iconic guitars, and I guess trying not to let my personal opinion do too much in it, because at first it was just like I threw the Super Strat out at first, just flat out, like this isn't in the runnings. Mm -hmm. But that's only because... I have a love-hate relationship with the Super Strat. <laughs> I mean, when I was younger, I loved it. All my guitars were Super Strats. From 92 up to about 90, I think I bought my first Les Paul in 97. Up until that point, everything I had was either an Ibanez RG series or it was a, a Jackson Stealth series or some sort of Super Strat, you know, Super Strat body, uh, Floyd Rose or licensed tremolo. And what, at some point in my life, and I don't, I'm not exactly sure, what, actually I do, I don't remember exactly when it happened. There was a, a point in my life it went from being, uh, the uh, Floyd Rose went from being a godsend to a bane of my existence. Yeah. And it happened all in a couple of weeks. And it was when I moved to Greensboro. Because before, I kind of pretty much not to offend anybody, but for the most part, I kind of drove the bus on most of the bands that I was in before I moved to Greensboro. So, you know, when you're, when you're kind of low-key controlling everything, you don't, it, you know, you control the tuning, you could, you help pick the songs, or you pick things that you don't have to deviate too far from what you're doing, you know. Right. But when I got to Greensboro, I didn't have that group of people to play with anymore, so I had to make new friends. <laughs> and uh, I had, at the time, I bought this ESP, a real, a real ESP uh, Kirk Hammett signature. I got, I, I walked, I basically fell face first into this great deal of the store that had bought one, and they had it for three or four years, and they couldn't sell it. That's one of the advantages as opposed to being like that. Yeah, <laughs> right. So then I walked in and I'm like, well, what kind of deal can we make on that guitar? <laughs> he said, we'll sell it to you for cost. I said, get that <laughs> the wall. <laughs> we can make a deal. So, and I loved it. I mean, I loved that guitar for a long time, but then I moved here. And when I moved here, I had to start auditioning for bands all over again. And it was like one day I go audition for a band and I get there. And they have neglected to tell me that, oh, we're tuned down to, you know, we're tuned down to D standard, drop C. Drop M. <laughs> like, I'm going to be natural. I'm like, <laughs> so I was like having to set my guitar up like four or five times a week to go in each one of these. Different and you've things, ever, yeah. you ever set up a, a, I remember, a Floyd Rose. I remember, I remember when you were doing all this. Yeah, you, if you're, you know, if you've had a Floyd Rose, you know, that is a pain in the freaking ass to set that thing up that many here, times. Here, here's one, here's one for you, folks. This is before uh, anybody, you know, I wasn't wasn't aware of this because nobody, I wasn't, I've never done it, and I wasn't listening to bands that were using heavier gauges strings, heavier gauges gauges of strings to compensate for the low tuning. Uh, our boy uh, Sam Smith yeah. and his drummer, I, uh, I can't remember the drummer's name now, but he, he was playing electronic drum set. We're doing, we're, we're tuning to B. 
So I had Doug's, and it was my Doug, my steel guitar. Doug Steel yeah. made super strap. Used to have, a, used to have, a, used to have a company around here. Doug Steel had a company. He had apprentice with Roscoe and Zion. Mm -hmm. Went on his own steel guitars. I got to him after he'd already shut down, and because uh, my bass player at the time, Scott Davenport, was uh, using one of his basses. Mm -hmm. So he said, "Yeah, I'll give you Doug's number." Got Doug to make me one, and. Uh, so I had the, the Doug Steel, the, uh, it's called, it's a, the brat body style, but the, the name of it, we named it is The Rock, mm -hmm. with two E's. He thought it looked better with two E's, like right. The. And uh, so Sam tells me, yeah, we're tuning to B. So I go to Doug, have him set up my guitar for B, just with what I always played, which is D Dario 9. <laughs> 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 It was like spaghetti strings, right. and it was kind of cool, you know. Now I wouldn't do that. I would use some kind of heavier, go up a gauge or so, and do something Me with nine. So it was crazy, though. It was definitely wow. crazy. Okay. It didn't, it, you know, it didn't last long. We played together a little bit, and just you know, went you definitely didn't have to worry about breaking a string in that group. No, 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 no string tension whatsoever on that day. I kind of had the same experience when I uh, when I finally got a, a decent. Um, guitar that wasn't some crazy thing. Uh, I guess I thought I was taking myself a little more seriously as a guitarist at the time. Um, was a uh, Charvel Model 3 mm -hmm. and it was everything that you would have wanted an 80s guitar to be. It had the uh, double locking trim, um, the really hot uh, humbucker at the bridge, uh, the crazy crackle finish on it, uh, reverse headstock. and. Uh, I, oh man, this is great! I can play Icon and Dock and all I want. Icon, and then when, yeah, Icon. <laughs> when you and then when you hear like Fair Warning, it's like oh, I got to tune this down. Yeah, now. To get, and, and then, plus when Eddie's, uh, you know, he just tunes, picks a string and then tunes them all to that string. It doesn't matter. Like on any given day, he just tunes whatever till it's it's in tune, <laughs> and then that's the tuning. Yeah. He's like a mad scientist. I mean, you I know, Black Sabbath but... did that too, a lot. <laughs> you know, it's like what tune was never that? tuned to a tune. It was just okay. What's in tune? And I'll tune the rest of them to that. Give me an E. <laughs> so anyway, something. that's okay. But uh, yeah, at some point you realize the limitation of, mm -hmm. and that, I mean, I still played with those things a lot. Pretty much every guitar I had until I was about twenty eight, twenty nine, had a, a floating bridge of some sort and. Uh, then you you'll lose one of those little blocks that locks, and you'll have to order one from uh, you know uh, Japan, Japan or something, and it'll be like new old stock because they actually don't make that bridge anymore, right. and it cost you like exactly. twenty bucks to get that. <laughs> yeah, that's when it began. I, so I did that back during a time before you know there was a there, you know time before the internet, obviously, and uh, you couldn't get. From Ibanez, you couldn't get the individual pieces to the bridge because I called Ibanez when uh, one day I was changing strings on my RG five. I think it was a five sixty, five seventy, five sixty. It's the one without the pick guard. And I guess I wasn't. I never really studied how the bridge was put together, so I didn't pay any attention. But I had, to, you know, I had them all screwed back so I could take the strings out. And then I dropped something, so I went to go pick it up and link the guitar forward, and one of the blocks just falls out. <laughs> Into the abyss of the floor. And the, I never found it. it. Yeah, never found it. And I'm like, oh, God. So now I'm on the, you know, like day before internet, you had to get on the phone and had to call the American rep, and then that put me in contact with them. And I mean, the amount of money that they wanted, they wouldn't they wouldn't send me the piece. They would, send, they would only send me a bridge. <laughs> well, to get the bridge sent from Japan was going to cost me about, I bought the guitar used, so it was going to cost me about what I paid for the guitar. <laughs> so I wound up just, I wound up Avro engineering something. I took like a whole bunch of Reynolds wrap and I <laughs> folded it real that. tight and <laughs> stuck it in there and clamped it in. And that, I mean, it lasted for another two or three years I waited for it and <laughs> sold it. But uh, yeah. Uh, Wait, I got a footnote on my B tuning uh, Doug Steel Super Strat guitar. Uh, it was double locking trim. It was a Godo patent Floyd, mm -hmm. you know, patent Floyd patent Godo. And, uh, you know, I, and to, to this day, the people are going to damn laugh their ass off. That is my favorite double locking bar system I've ever owned. I've owned, no, no, no. I've owned real Floyds, and this is my favorite one. Something about it, it just feels the best of anyone I've ever had. And 
it it tight to tighten the bar because I'm generally a guy that likes the bar tight, not loose hanging. You you know have a little uh, you know a little uh, screw, screw in place and you you put the Allen wrench in and, and <laughs> tighten it. Well, it got stripped, so my tech, who you know, Tom Henry, had to put a shim in, the and it's ultra tight now. Like at first, he said, you know, he said, take and like put it in your mouth, lick, you know, lick it a little, and and do it every time you do it, and it'll loosen it up more because it was like wicked tight after you put the shim in. So you know, you gotta yeah. do what you gotta do. No, I, you know, I'll never, and it still works fine to this day. You know? I, I'll never make fun of anyone that shim. picks a, a different. Floyd Rose over the original Floyd Rose and said they like it better. I mean, to be honest with you, my favorite Floyd style bridge is the Ibanez stuff. Mm -hmm. I love the uh, I love the uh, Edge Zero. I love the Edge Pro. Um, I do like I've had I've only had one guitar with a Floyd Rose original, and it was a it was really good. It was a really good bridge. I did like it. It was which was the ESP Kurt yeah. Hammett. And it was it was good, but I mean, I think my Edge Pro was probably just as just as good as that bridge was on any given day. But um, uh, not to get too far off topic, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so your your choice is going to be the the Flying V. I think it would be mine, yeah. Yeah, as far as iconic, uh, yeah. And yours was. I would say if you're talking like all time. <clears throat> in rock, it, it's split between Les Paul and, and Strat, but my favorite era is the Super Strat <clears throat> era because I came up when it was getting produced and that's what I wanted in a guitar and it was like perfect, you know, especially when I got, I didn't get this till, this one, the Doug Steele guitar, till like 95-ish, 96, uh, and you know, that's that's the type of stuff I you know played. I, I played Kramers and you know. <clears throat> See, I don't really look at. Um, I don't put a lot of demarcation between a Strat and a Super Strat because, in my opinion, a, a Super Strat is just a Strat at its core, right. basically. If you look at, it, it's sort of like the same at the same time as uh, aftermarket uh, mm -hmm. was becoming big for cars. It's sort of that same culture started to arise uh, in places like Southern California with the, the guitars. And the first ones, because they're so modular, yeah. you can swap necks, swap bodies, swap pickups pretty easily with the strats. Yeah, but uh, the thing I would have to counter that argument, um, because I, I mean, I have a strat and a super strat, and I've, I've played those a lot. That's probably two of the, two of the instruments I play the most. And playing a strat is a completely different animal than playing a super strat. I oh, mean yeah. Especially their, their their construction <clears throat> is the same and I will give you that their construction is the same but the you know everything from the 24 fret fretboard to the rear routing which does give it a which does does affect it tonally uh, as opposed to having the big cavity routed out in the middle of the guitar. Mm -hmm. um, you know super strats are typically going to be so you, I mean, you get some super strats that are like 22 fretboards, but for the most part, the, the, the normal super strat, 24 frets, and it's going to be somewhere around a uh, 14 to 16 inch fretboard radius, which, you know, a strat's going to get about a 9.5, <laughs> which is a completely different playing field. And then, you know, you might get, you I mean, you do have a couple of model of strats now that have a Floyd Rose, but then you're also talking about the difference between that as also is a, you got the recessed Floyd Rose on uh, a strat. You know, to me, it's like the difference between a strat and a super strat to me is almost as great as the difference between a, a PRS and a Les Paul. To me, they just feel like completely different animals. Like, oh, yeah, like me, like I, for me, I, you know, super strat. I'm definitely doing a humbucker in the bridge at least. No. And the and the other I think the other big difference between uh, the strat and the super strat. I've always said you can play anything on a strat. You and you can. You can play anything on a strat. But if we're talking about overall versatility, I believe that the super strat has way more versatility than the stratocaster does. Because <laughs> In you know in your in your four and three when you're not four and three your four and two positions on your toggle switch where you're splitting the coils in those in between positions you can get those same 
three and four sound that you get from a Stratocaster when you're just taking the you know the right inside like, of like, the of the humbucker and then the middle single coil. Mm -hmm. But you can't necessarily, although I can get some of those Stratty type tones out of my Super Strat, you cannot get that humbucker tone out of the Stratocaster itself unless you yeah. And I think, taking part in I understand the point you you're making there, and I think we're just probably it's just an issue of semantics. But uh, I, <clears throat> if you look at uh, what the original super strats were, they were just modest strats. I mean, they would do some radical modifications. So obviously, putting a, a humbucker in, uh, maybe a, a graphite nut, which I think was the closest thing to a, a stability uh, or a stable um, tray that you had at the point. Um, you probably have somebody laid the neck. Uh, and get a different profile or right. radius for yourself, um, but it, it was it was only maybe until like the very early '80s that manufacturers kind of caught up with that, and it started with people who were in the proximity of like Wayne Charvel's shop and places like that, like you, you know, the uh, um, Carvins, uh, your uh, Charvel Jacksons, Beast Riches, because they were all yeah. there in Los Angeles, and it sort of radiated it out. What East, the East Coast with Kramer. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. Like I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I don't deny that the the Stratocaster oh the Super Strat's DNA you know is laced with Strat DNA but in my opinion the Stratocaster is as close to a Super Strat as a dual rectifier or Mesa Boogie Mark 1 is to a Fender amplifier because that's where it started Mesa Boogie started off by modding Fender amps, Sheraton's but amps, today yeah. it's its own thing, and I, I I dare say that the changes that have been made to the to the Super Strat now is that it, it started off as just being a modded Stratocaster, but it moved between between the, the the design changes that Eddie made and then what later the design changes <laughs> that Steve Vai made that went on to become the norm in production now, I feel like it's moved on, it's done the same thing Mesa Boogie's done, is it's, it's moved on to be its own, it's, it's really its own creature. Um, if you go to, a, a, like, you know, a lot of what was done to the Strat now, um, uh, then was done out of necessity. But you go to a lot of luthiers now, you take a Strat to a lot of luthiers now, and you and you start telling them you want them to do the things that, uh, that they were doing back then. And the first thing they're going to say to you is, and I've had I've had three different Luthers tell me this, it would be better for you to just buy a Super Strat because it'll never <coughs> play the way that will, because it wasn't built to do this from jump. And that's and that is why I always say that the Super Strat, although it started that way, is its own thing because most Luthers will even tell you, say, yeah, you could mod this Strat, but it'll never play the way this does because this was built to do that and this was built to do this yeah but we uh, made it do we made this do that back then because that didn't exist <laughs> sure if you take like a uh a, a, a beast rich gunslinger and put it up against a 59 oh, no. <laughs> um, i like those they're obviously very different guitars and, and it's just these little uh innovations and evolutions that have Taking place over the last thirty odd years, mm -hmm. well, like, not forty these days. Um, but yeah, I, I guess what I was trying to say is that um, I see where it started. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you're right. A lot mm -hmm. of those things that, that happened were radical for the time. Now, some of the super strats aren't that far removed from Stratocasters, like the Charvel stuff. Charvels really aren't that far mm -hmm. removed because most of those. Don't you know? Most of those don't have the recessed tremolo cavities, so it's still just like in the old days where you took the Floyd Rose and you just slapped it there on top. And yeah. and the, and the, and the exactly. body for some of those. I I like the recessed cavity. The steel oh, yeah. has recessed cavity. Any gotta guitar have, I played gotta have a recessed cavity. Is is because without the recessed cavity, you lose okay. a lot of the of the up pull. Right. Yeah. It's just. Uh, uh, it's just like I said. It's, it's just uh, from yeah from a mechanical point of view. It's just it's just a, it's a it's a bad design. I mean, a lot of people do it because they're like they like their old school, whatever. But it's just a bad design. But when you look at a Charvel, you know, like the like the so is it the SoCal? Mm -hmm. You look at Charvel SoCal and you go, 
you pop that Floyd Rose off the back end of that, and you throw a single coil on that bridge, that's a strat. <laughs> so in that part, he is right on that. I guess I guess you have to what was it? It depends on uh, yeah, what kind of super strat you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I mean it's kind of a super strat's kinda of like a it's a broad stroke yeah, nowadays. And I remember that was the problem with any type of top mounted Floyd was you had to be real careful where you uh, pulled up the harmonic yeah, you're you're the break it, you're breaking the damn oh, string. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, and and I'll be honest, I, I actually like some of the more stratty looking super strats. Uh, that's probably not the PC place to be, but like I, I, I really like the, uh, I've, been, I've been thinking about calling them and seeing if I can get a left-handed one. I, I really like the um, Jakey e. Lee signature strat. Not the blue one, but the, the white one with the pick card. Right. Mm -hmm. I like that. I would play that. Or the uh, or the Adrian Smith signature. Right, right. That's uh, right. When you said that, I was thinking about that. Uh, one. Not the not not the Dave Murray one. Not the actual Strat with the uh, Floyd Rose on it. I don't want that. But the the, the Jackson, the, the Adrian the Adrian's yeah, the new shit. That's nice. Yeah, I'd definitely. like that. But you look at that guitar and you go, all right, well, you know, that's a Strat. <laughs> that's yeah. a Strat with a Floyd Rose on it and a humbucker and bridge. It's a Strat. But if I hold that guitar up to like my RG five fifty, like that's super strat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Recess, flat fretboard. Well, I can't say that because the, the the Adrian Smith has a compound radius fretboard, which now Fender has started to do do more of that now on their guitars. And Fender can do that because they didn't create that box around themselves as far as a, a marketing mm -hmm. standpoint that Gibson did. No, the they did Yeah. They really did. But diehard Fender fans can be a little fidgety too. Like, yeah. you know, when they came out with the uh, noiseless pickups, you, then you had this whole market of pickup gurus that were like, you know, we don't like the sound of the noiseless pickups because it doesn't sound like a vintage pickup. and. Blah 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 blah. I listen to them. Yeah, with all my the humming, with all the humming that I can't right. stand. Right, exactly. It's like, oh no, no, it sounds just like the fifties. Can we please move forward to the present day? Technology is a dangerous thing, but you know, people in the guitar industry they don't like tech. They don't like change. Man, they do not like change. But anyway, I guess in, in wrapping this one up. Um. I guess just to see where our choices lie on the spectrum. If I ask you, who's who would be like your most iconic guitar player within the genre of rock or metal? My for my instrument uh, choice. No, no, no. Uh, just for you, you in general. Oh, just for me in general. Okay. Um, well, I hate to bring this up, but you know, <laughs> it, it's Eddie Van Halen. Uh, oh, well, okay. Yeah, even as a uh, uh, as a failed guitar player, read that bassist. I I still take a lot of influence in the way I play. Okay. From him, so. All right. So you picked a Flying V, but your most iconic player is a Super Strat player? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Most iconic player. And yeah, so I would say that the most iconic guitar player, and it's not even someone I'm totally into at all, is going to be Jimmy Page. Because, you know, Zeppelin at the height of their powers, I mean, that was the guy. The, the, the stage outfits, the persona, the Les Paul the music, everything, and you know, for me of all time, let's say my favorite hard rock band of all time is UFO, period, but especially Michael Shanker lineup. Right. That's that's yeah. that's the lineup that I like. That's my favorite, you know, thing of all time. But uh as far as like personal choice would be that and like my two favorites probably Randy Rhodes and Uli Roth. So your answer was uh, answer was answer, <laughs> I've got three guys now. Right? Right. Because because my personal choices came into effect. Right. But as far as like iconic guy of all right. time, I would say Jimmy Page Jimmy because Page. of the fact that okay. how big Zeppelin was and right. he, he was the guy. Now, me as a player, I don't like Jimmy Page's lead playing at all. I mean there's certain stuff he does I do like, uh, but I'm just I'm not that guy. I don't like. I, I, there's a hundred other players I'd rather listen to 
then I, I can listen to dudes from the twenties and thirties that I'd like better listening than listening to Jimmy Page's lead work. Okay. But but like Zeppelin's uh, tunes, like House is the Holy album, it, it's freaking incredible. <clears throat> and you know you can name a bunch of. Them. Okay. Uh, I hate to be generic, but I guess I'm gonna have to just uh, default to my generic setting. Uh, and God, I, you don't know how much I hate to say this, to, but boy, people that know me know how much I hate to say this. But I'm gonna go Hendrix. I hate to say Hendrix. It hurts me in my soul to say Jimi Hendrix, only because. I'm a black left-handed left guitar <laughs> player. And for some reason, people always gravitate to, oh, you're a big Hendrix fan. Right? <laughs> Hendrix is your major influence, isn't it? They're like, well, no, actually, Steve Vai is probably my, <laughs> you know, the guy I like the most, person I listen to. Steve Vai, maybe a close second. Ty Tabor, maybe uh, Nuno Bittencourt. But, um, but when I think iconic, imagery of rock music I think of Jimi Hendrix at the Monterey Pop Festival with the on his knees with the guitar on fire and I go yeah that's and then see I could <laughs> yeah. I could I could have went that choice too but I was thinking like you know the solidification of hard rock and mm -hmm. into metal leaning into metal uh, but yeah I totally get that because he I mean I this is what I was he was the first rock star guitar player Right, and, and there's guys, there's guys in the '60s that I love, like uh, uh, Alvin Young, freaking Robbie Krieger from The Doors, one of the most underrated '60s guitarists of all time. Mm -hmm. And but Jimmy was the man; he was the rock star guitarist of anybody before Blackmore, anybody you could name. So I, I totally get that. So I guess in, in closing on the on on our discussion on iconic instruments, I guess we. All three of us pretty much basically picked an instrument opposite of the person <laughs> that we would pick as the iconic representation of the genre, which uh, although no, I, I picked like split between Les Paul and Stratton and Jimmy uh, Jimmy Page. A lot of times played Les Paul, so you know. Oh, I get okay. You sort of made it. Sort of you kind of got, got it. You kind of got it. Well, yeah, I can see that. Well, you know, I hey. think when you think of iconography, when you think of um, an image, we can take any of those players, put a backlight behind them, and know who that was. Yeah. So if you had, you know, Hendrix on his knees doing this deal uh, with the hair up the hair, you know that's Hendrix. Or you wow. saw um, uh, Paige with uh, the little bow. Telecaster and the bow. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. 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 Very iconic uh, visualization. Or, or, you know, or, or Eddie. Or Eddie, know, yeah. The, Eddie in various stages of <laughs> play, like it's Eddie. Uh, but anyway, so that's going to conclude uh, this rambling, <laughs> and uh, we'll pick up and uh, hit you guys back with another one.